IGT, its perspective tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Good Monday evening to you. Clearly the shootings over the weekend have dominated the psychology of the news cycle and the American public. Uh, we'll do what we can to examine that over the course of the week. Production note, we will be uh, on a repeat for a couple of days this week uh, and back live uh, with new programming on Thursday. So. Uh, patience on that, although, I, you know, I, it's not like I'm delivering a message of such profundity that it'll change the world. I think all of us are really trying to figure out what to say about any of this at this point. Um, everybody's got a perspective. Now we're in the middle of the preseason of a presidential race, and um, it's our natural instinct to discount that which candidates have to say, and it's just, hmm. And then the president uh, made a presentation today, and I, I don't know. Uh, you figure out for yourself if it fell short. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I've been looking forward to this program for, for a while. The, uh, the boss at IGT, you know, GTEC, used to be GTEC. Uh, everything in Rhode Island is used to be, or where it used to be. Uh, a very important multi-billion dollar conversation going on in this state right now. Here was at our press time early this afternoon, the latest that I wouldn't use have produced to be the catalyst for a lot of good things to happen. It was 2003 when then-Governor Don Kachiri first inked a 20-year deal with gaming firm GTEC. Now the company, since renamed IGT, wants lawmakers to extend the deal by another 20 years. Under the proposal, IGT would keep a headquarters in Providence through 2043, maintain at least 1,100 permanent Ryland jobs, and get to operate 85% of the state's slot machines. This is an economic development partnership. Bob Vincent is chairman of IGT. It's the continuation of a very successful partnership that began in 2003. But the company hired by the state lottery to manage Rhode Island's casinos, Twin River, isn't happy. They've taken out full-page ads labeling the proposal a secret no-bid contract, arguing to give one gaming company monopoly control of the machines on the casino floor is unprecedented in the industry and is significantly harming Rhode Island taxpayers. According to Vincent, that's not the whole story. He tells me Twin River approached IGT in May, asking to take over hundreds of its slot machines. But it was their notion that in order to get this deal done, in order to get these agreements done, uh, we would need their support and their involvement or they wouldn't be approved. So there was an implied threat to you about uh, a lobbying campaign against IGT. Listen, when someone comes to you and said you should really forego tens of millions of dollars a year and include us in your operation, you have to ask yourself why. So I shall ask myself why, Mr. <laughs> Vincent. Great to, to have you. Thanks for joining me. Nice to be here, Dan. Why? I don't know. I think uh, a great deal has come out since uh, that, uh, that uh, interview has taken place. Uh, clearly, uh, Twin River had approached the state uh, and seeking a much larger deal than is uh, the agreements we have uh, to take over everything. And uh, they clearly have uh, very strong ambitions, I think driven by the hedge fund uh, uh, majority, not majority, but major shareholder they have that's driving them to go off and do uh, much bigger things and try to grab all of the revenues coming out of the state's operation there. You know, we're the third on the chain of who gets what. I mean, the state gets the largest percentage of the revenues. Twin River gets $281 million a year from that operation, and we get about 50 with the agreements we have. So uh, you'd have to. I, I can only imagine the motivation, but you know, all of a sudden there's a hedge fund involved from New York City. They get a new guy in charge of uh, the Rhode Island operation, and lo and behold, they've been at the state house uh, numerous times, bringing their shareholder with them to pitch a deal that's far in excess of what anyone ever anticipated. All right. So there's there's so much that we need to do in terms of background and and just you know how did we get here from here from there. But let me let me see if I can get to a couple of punchlines early. The big conversation is, is to bid or not to bid, uh, and well, that's the pushback, at least, uh, mm -hmm. from some members of the General Assembly, uh, other pundits, uh, and the like. The governor uh, has made this preliminary agreement with you. Uh, she wants to send it to the General Assembly, needs to send it to the General Assembly for approval. The big question that I need some clarity on is, 
if the General Assembly makes it a bidding process, will IGT compete for the contract? Listen, I, I, let's go back, and I, I think it is good to go back a little bit. This is an economic development agreement. You can try and break it down into its separate components, but within this agreement is our guarantee of 1,100 jobs going forward, very good paying jobs going forward that are here in Rhode Island now and that are currently linked to this contract. Uh, we also have agreed to maintain our headquarters. Linked because they're, because they're they're literally part of the agreement. They are part of the agreement, and, and it's a very important part of the agreement. This is the only place in the world where we have employment level agreements beyond what's necessary to service that contract. So in Rhode Island, if we didn't have these employment, employment level agreements, we would need about 60 people to run this contract. The other thousand people we have are folks that do things beyond the Rhode Island contract that have evolved here. State got a very good deal uh, back in 2003. Meaning they're portable, signs, or, the, or, the, or the jobs, jobs are portable. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at, I think it's important to look at the company from where it was in 2003 to where it is now. It was a single company back in 2003, located in Rhode Island, doing business around the world, but its headquarters was in Rhode Island. We were acquired by uh, Lotomatica Group, then merged with IGT, acquired IGT in Nevada, so now we are a $5 billion international company with, with uh, operations and headquarters all around the world. So yes, there are many different options. And all we've said to the state, in that this was an economic development agreement to begin with, the jobs were linked to it, We'd like to understand what our relationship is going forward. Uh, let us plan, as we do as a company, because uh, we are in a stage of, of looking at our contracts, looking at our operations, working smarter, more efficient, and consolidating. So we look at Rhode Island and say it's been a great place, but it's the only place where we have guarantees of this nature. And we ask the state, what's the intent going forward? If you're going to go bid the contracts and relieve us of our obligation to maintain these employment levels, We'd like to understand that as we go forward. So what you're telling me, if I hear you correctly, some may say, hey, Dan, you let him get away without answering the question. Um, are you telling me that the question isn't ripe yet? It is not. I think what the, what's before the General Assembly now and what was before the state prior to that was very simple. I haven't run into anyone who doesn't like IGT and the jobs. To be honest, everyone says, these are great jobs. We want you to be here. We like you being here. We want to make sure those jobs continue here in the future. So then you look at the, at the agreements we've put in place. And you have to, it, it's not agreements to support jobs at any cost. What we've said to the state and what they've reviewed and looked at, these are jobs that are, I'm, excuse me, these are agreements that are market driven, fair market value. If you go to market, you're not going to get a better deal, likely to get a better deal on this. But if you go to market and relieve us of the jobs that we are committed to, the downtown headquarters, the opportunity for the state to continue to look at any new expansion plans we have, that goes away. Well, if I'm the General Assembly pushing back, and by the way, this notion that this is all about transparent government and, and the like, um, I, I, I got a bridge I'd like to sell you. There's no purity here, okay? <laughs> this is about making money. And as much as I respect you and your company, uh, your company's not uh, other and doing. Your company is in the business of being a good citizen, no doubt. But you're not necessarily by organic existence benevolent. Uh, believe me, neither is Twin River uh, in this particular case. And those who cry wolf or those who point fingers or glass houses, whatever cliche you want to use, we have a little situation here when they talk about no bid. They'd like to have no bid. They'd like to have no bid on what they're doing right now. And by the way, as they're yelling, "Bad guy, no bid," they're trying to get no bid. Uh, so we, 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 there's a whole bunch of reality behind the scenes. But to the point of whether you would bid, General Assembly, if it changes what's going on, the dynamic between the governor and you right now, uh, meaning this, this renewal agreement that you've, you've put on paper, they may decide in order to, 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 to keep this jobs thing intact that the bid requires that kind of employment to be as much a part of the new bidding process that your agreement holds true, holds now. Is that practical? Listen, I, I, I don't believe so. All right, well, hold on to that thought, because I would like to be able to, to, to develop that. We'll come right back and we'll talk about why that is not practical, according to our guest. Stay with us. 
this isn't the business they're in, and this is the third biggest source of revenue for Rhode Island, I think it would be incredibly risky to turn over this to a business that has zero track record in it. Look, the governor has already been wounded by, by um, maybe not risk, but inefficiency or, or non-performance. Just think about what happened with the computer brain that ran, that runs the entire welfare system in this state and the UHIP as it's known and the outcry. Uh, my first instinct before I, before I had a chance to meet uh, Bob Vincent or anybody else, by the way, Twin River is on the show next Monday to, to respond or to you know, lay their own groundwork on this. My first instinct, instinct on this was, hmm, she's probably right. Hmm. If the food stamp program wasn't being well executed, could you imagine what happens if the lottery tickets weren't weren't? Being <laughs> Whoa! And we'll get to that in a second. But I asked you about whether there was a practicality to a bidding process established by the General Assembly that would call for and demand the kind of job levels that you've agreed to in your current deal authorized with you and Governor Kacheri back then. You say not practical because? I don't know how you practically guarantee that, boy, I'll bring in these jobs. I th you'll find people who are willing to say that, but we have jobs that pay over $100,000 a year. We have a $111 million annual payroll here, and someone's going to come before you and say, yeah, I'll do that. Sure, I'll do that, and I'll come in, and I'll run your lottery, and I'll run your gaming system. Uh, listen, we're, we're one of the market leaders in, in, this, in this area. This is what we do. This is how the company has grown. The jobs are here now. I think what's incumbent upon, bless you, oh, yeah, incumbent upon uh, those that are looking at the deal <laughs> is to determine what the, if, is it a fair deal for the state? Well, here, something was really interesting the other day. I talked to a very old school politician who's been around a long time. He's not in your mix right now, but it was what I'm serving. And he says to me, he says, you know, this is so easy. What you do is you go out to bid, and you just write it to the specs of the IGT deal. <laughs> and I said, well, first of all, that's very old school. The second of all, at this point, I think everybody would kind of see uh, the situation. And D, it's probably not fair practice, but it might be old school politics. Uh, to your credit, you're not looking for anything. Well, let me not put words in mouth. The 20-second answer to the average person's question, how come it's just not fair for you to compete, is? You're requiring us to maintain a 1,000 jobs here in Rhode Island uh, and yet go and bid out contracts at the same time. You're asking us to enter into an economic because development Because this interim agreement. period, the, your, contract exp your current contract expires in four years? Correct. Yeah. Three, three, and a half. three and a half years. So you're talking about this three or four year time period mm -hmm. as you are preparing or, or, or issuing a bid for long term, retaining those jobs now in the interim is problematic, why? Oh, I, uh, let, me, let me be very clear about that. We have a contract now that requires have us to, do it. to have a thousand people here and we will. Right. What we're talking about is the states, and you mentioned the computer systems and the complexity of those systems. The state has two main computer systems, one for the lottery, one for the gaming machines. Uh, there isn't any lottery, I think, in the U.S. that could go out to bid for both of those systems simultaneously and try to convert them simultaneously without significant risk. There's inter interdependencies, there's all, and, and you need an organization uh, of considerable size to undertake something like that just for one of those bids. So what we've said to the state is we realize that you have to do this sequentially, not at the same time. You need to do one system now and another system later. It takes about two years to bid these systems and convert them. Wow. So that's what we've said to the state. This is military-grade security. You're issuing a ticket to somebody that could be a bear bond for a billion dollars with the way lotteries are running right now. It has to be perfect. We've made our reputation and grown this company by providing the integrity and security that lotteries need to do this. If you're going to go out to bid and say, oh, we can do that too, and raise your hand and say, well, we'll bring in people to do that, I just think you first should look at say, what's wrong with the system we have now, extending what we have now, keeping the economic development benefits that we get from that agreement, and making sure at the same time that it's a market-driven agreement for the state. You have two major competitors in the business. Correct. Where is your market share comparative to theirs? 
Uh, if you look at the amount of revenues that flow through lotteries in the United States, we have about 84% flows through IGT systems. So we're a market leader in that uh, by far. We're a market leader in systems uh, that run gaming programs around the country, both commercially and for state lotteries, and we're a, a leader as well in supplying slot machines. If Twin River comes in and operates this, hypothetically, it, it's really kind of funny. The, 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 I, I don't mean to be crass, and I'm looking forward to talking to the Twin River guys about this, but it's kind of like saying, well, if I shoot 67 this weekend on the golf course, and if anybody knows my game, <laughs> that ain't happening. So when Twin River says, if we operate, it, it, it really, the, uh, the distinct, I, I think there might be some similarities. They don't know how to run your business, and it's that's not, what the governor is trying to say in this particular case. There are, there, there are three separate sorts of, of roles being played here. The lottery operates the gaming program. They decide what machines go on the floor. They decide how that place is going to be operated. They also operate the lottery, obviously, but they operate that floor. We're our technology provider. We provide the systems and machines to do that. We've grown to be an international leader in all that. We're a $5 billion annual, uh, annual revenues each year. We're a leader in that. We're good at that. Uh, Twin River is a hospitality vendor. They do a good job, they, but they, their job is to provide the amenities, to do the marketing and manage that program. They are not technology people, and what, they've, you know, what they say is, well, well, we'll bring in some people we know. But, but, it's very so, risky. But, there's, but there's, no, there's no mystery as to who they bring in. They bring in either one of your two competitors <laughs> or they try to make a deal with you. And it seems to me if they make a deal with you, all they've actually done is just carved out a bigger margin to operate everything more or less the exact same way. Am I missing something? I, I think if if you go to bid on, on some of these, and if you go to bid in the way you're describing, you're going to bring in a second tier provider. That's going to bring a second tier provider into the program. I just told you we have about 84% market share. That makes us the leader in what goes on in this industry. We, uh, we've really established ourselves well there. So you know, I look at it and say, you have a Rhode Island company with Rhode Island Jobs here, providing these services, some of the best services in the world. You can independently look at that very easily, but the market has spoken in that regard. All right. When we come back, we'll talk about this Rhode Island company run by a foreign corporate headquarters. Stay with us. So Twin River is, is, is now media blitzing, and I, I have to tell you, uh, you know, all due respect, and they're fine people at Twin River. You hand off this stuff to, uh, you know, marketing geniuses, and you come up with some of the real schmaltzy radio ads that are running right now. I'm not going to run them here, probably uh, on my own radio. Well, they're running on my own radio program. Hey, did you hear that the governor did a secret bid deal, a no bid deal with them? It's like, uh, you know, the, the, you got to almost <laughs> laugh if you weren't so involved in it. The, the governor is actually looking at a renewal of a contract that already exists that was not bid in its original form. Correct. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, but it's all part of the uh, it's all part of the all's fair in love and war, I guess, uh, mindset here. The foreign uh, ownership now of IGT. I'm guessing is emotionally less invested than even you would be as a old-fashioned Rhode Island guy. So tell me about that dynamic. That puts pressure on you. You, Listen, you we have, have to become more of a mercenary, don't you? We have really good employees here. And what's evolved over time is we have some of our highest value employees here, as well as the corporate leadership of the company. Uh, with our CFO, myself, uh, the head of HR, we're all here in Rhode Island. So. There is an attachment to the place. I think there is a definite respect for the contribution that the individuals here make to us. But when you come down to it, there are options. And uh, the emotion, we try not to have emotion in you when you make business decisions. You make smart business decisions. That's what it's about. The, uh, so the answer is, those guys, I'm sure, uh, respect the idea that it's boss in America would like to keep it in his home hometown and, and live up to the current agreements, but 
you might be geographically more 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 situated in Vegas and, and do do a better job, right? I mean, if this thing blows up, you there are there you're, certainly you're options. Portable. There are certainly options. All the jobs we have here are portable in the final analysis. Yes, they are. They're not they're not based in Rhode Island for a specific person uh, because of ge uh, geographics. It's it's simply they are mobile. And the 15 mil or so that you're making in Rhode Island, comparative to your gross earnings. No, it's uh, Rhode Island is a good contract for us. Uh, we we've enjoyed it and uh, benefit from it very well. It's not in the top ten of our contracts. Uh, you know, we we run the California, New York, New Jersey. Uh, you know, very large lotteries around the Does United States. Is the phrase States. "no skin off my nose"? No, no. Listen, Does it play uh, listen. Here? We we you know you build up a business like this with a portfolio of contracts, and this is a good one and a very prominent one in that portfolio. How many contracts in the portfolio? Well, it, it, it does depend how you cut it. We do 28 states that have similar, uh, we run the central system for the lottery. We have about 48 states where we provide instant tickets. And You're international services. as well. Uh, we, have about a, we do business about 100 countries. What are you thinking about Alan Hassenfeld, uh, who has a standing invitation here, to come, who, 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 who decided to publicly state that the General Assembly needs to do a study on this, it hasn't been studied enough, and if they can't afford it, he'll pay for it. First of all, I already opined that if the state can't afford to pay for its own cons consultancy, I think we're in, in pretty bad shape. Uh, because no matter who is privately running uh, or writing the check, th that's not that's not good government, um, in my judgment. Uh, do we need Alan to the rescue here to, to run a consultancy because Listen, you guys I, just I haven't studied this well enough? Implicit in all of this is that the state hasn't studied this, and they have. They brought in outside consultants. They brought in law firms. The state being the administration. The, administration. the problem is the communication between the administration and the leadership of the general assembly. Yeah, but that's you why you have, that's why you have hearings. That's why you, you let the, the legislators, the rank and file, look at their committees, go through hearings on this. That's the speaker, and everyone is is pledged to do so. I think the hearing process would really help this along, so that you don't have people coming forward saying, "Oh, I know the way, and I can help here." Why not let the legislative process work here and have the hearings, have them in front of the public, and let the merits of this proposal come out? So I end with the same question. If it goes to a bid process, I know it's fluid. I know it could be quirky. Chances are you'll want to compete. Is there, is there a percentage or a zero to tenor you can put on that one? Oh, no, listen. I, we pursue opportunities. We're in the business of pursuing opportunities. We'll pursue that opportunities without the encumbrance of having to having to commit to maintaining a thousand employees in Rhode Island. It'll become another business opportunity, and certainly we evaluate those with a notion of bidding. However, this is an economic development agreement, and it's different. We are being asked to support these eleven hundred jobs. In so, this so state. really, what you're saying is you can't you can't put a thousand job guarantee into a bidding contract. And that's what you're saying, and that's what makes a difference. That's no, no, we would not. Yeah, no, I mean, they not. can't. They can't. They yeah. could, but yeah. it, it doesn't work. Uh, thank you for your time. We'll Thanks. be in touch. Uh, the boss at IGT. Final word, and we come back. Speaking of gaming, the actual constitutionality of sports get betting, which we didn't even get into in this conversation, is, uh, is still kind of lurking. Uh, tomorrow night, a reminder of the uh, litigation on that in a repeat performance for a summer show. And uh, we'll be back live on Thursday, or new on Thursday. See you on the radio at 3 on WPRO. Good night.